What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and today uh, we're going to do a review and ranking of the Steely Dan albums in the order of my personal favorite. Um, how did we get to Steely Dan through Frank Zappa? I'm pretty sure it was 74, maybe on the Pretzel Logic Tour, or before that album came out. Yeah, I think it was 74. Um, Steely Dan opened for Frank, or they toured together. I don't think they were co-billing. I think Steely Dan was the opener. Um, I think it's also in that tour, there's at least one reference to Billy not losing that number in like a, like an early 74 show, like joking around in a stink foot or something like that. Maybe even a don't you ever wash that. Um, but I remember hearing some Billy don't you lose that number reference somewhere in a 74 show. Um, also, Jim Gordon did play drums on Pretzel Logic. Um, he played with uh, Frank in the uh, Wazoo tours. And then... Um, I had one more connection that I'm forgetting right now. Um, don't remember the other one. It was very weird and it was a weak connection, but it was there. Um, there might be more, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, the name itself, Steely Dan, is a reference to something from William Burroughs' Naked Lunch that might, in fact, I do not know because I have seen, I have not seen it, um, might look like a Telefunken U-47, Possibly. And so I think Frank would, I think Frank would respect the name Steely Dan. So anyways, um, yeah, nine albums, not doing the live ones. Um, uh, just going to put them in the order of my favorite. Uh, my mom was a huge Steely Dan fan growing up. I know we listened to, uh, one, we listened to, if you've ever heard the movie soundtrack FM, I don't know if it's still out there on streaming. I still, I still have a CD copy. I still have a cassette copy. I still have a vinyl copy. I have three copies of that. Um, but uh, it was a movie called FM about an FM radio station. It came out in like the mid late seventies, like seventy eight maybe. But it was like a murderer's row of classic rock, like bands that at the time only had one album, maybe two albums, with a couple like heavier ones thrown in, um, or more successful ones thrown in. But it was just like Steely Dan was on there. FM, the song FM comes from the movie FM. Um, there was Tom Petty, Jimmy Buffett, Boston was on there, Linda Ronstadt, um, just the Eagles, Queen, like it was deep. And uh, my mom loved that album. And so growing up and like when I was seven or eight years old, all of those songs are just embedded in my soul. Uh, and then she bought uh, their gold compilation album, which is like, I guess it's a greatest hits, but it had like King of the World on there. It had uh, green earrings uh, here, here in the Western world. So some really kind of weird deep cuts for it to be sort of a greatest hits compilation, like not stuff you heard on the radio. Um, so I love that album. Uh, and then I remember when Gaucho came out, um, because the, one of the first CDs she bought was Gaucho. So we listened to that a lot. So anyways, I've been liking Steely Dan since I was like seven, six or seven, eight, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, when I'm done, you give me your list in the comments and uh, whatever. You know how comments work. Also, I would say of this list, the top two my whole life kind of go back and forth. And so if I were to do this in a month, they might change again. I think everything else is pretty pretty set in stone, maybe, I don't know. Anyways, all right, let's go on to nine albums, on to number nine. Number nine is their ninth album, Everything Must Go, and yeah, good title. Just just pack it in, boys. Um, I think the whole like accusation that Steely Dan is like this very smooth, bland, dad rock, overproduced, way too polished type generic rock. Like this is the example of what they were talking about. Like that has been used to describe their music in the seventies, which I think is wrong 100%. Um, though I do think on the surface, there is a definite sheen to it, but the, the lyrics are so subversive and the playing, the playing is also in a way kind of subversive that it doesn't really apply if you give it more than a casual listen. Not saying that with this. This. I want to turn it off after 10 seconds. I made myself re-listen to this album in its entirety for this video. I, I just, I don't like the way they sound. I feel it feels lifeless. It feels so overly crafted. Like I compare, I just did XTC, which is why I was inspired to do this one now, because I think XTC 
in their later years when they quit touring, kind of had the same model as Steely Dan. Like they went into the studio and like the studio was their performance, right? They weren't gonna go out and play this stuff live. Um, Steely Dan did more than XTC. Um, but XTC's is so much more well-crafted. I just think it just all works better. There's more life to it. There's more, they're using the studio in just a much better way. I don't think Steely Dan, like, this is just bland. It has no life. The drums in particular just seem like they, they don't sound programmed, but they could be programmed. Um, it's not necessarily that the sound is bad. It's not like an 80s, ooh, that 80s sound. It's just the choices they're making, I just can't get into. Um, I'm saying all this now because what I say now essentially applies to the next album on this list also. Um, I think there's like three good songs on here. I kind of like Godwacker. Um, I like uh, Green Book and I like the title track, the last track. All of them have somewhat chiller vibes, maybe more kind of low key, slinky, maybe, I don't want to say funky, but maybe a little low key, slow burning funk in it. Everything Must Go has a little nice horn intro in it. Um, so there's a couple moments, three songs on here, which are passable. And maybe I like them because everything around them I don't like. Um, and so I'm like, oh, something that's not just that dad rock that I, I, I do think is just blah. So I understand why people would like this. I do see the attraction in it, but I can't. And I will probably never listen to this album again, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, though I might revisit, and I doubt it. All right, but yeah, that's number nine, Everything Must Go. Number eight is their eighth album, Two Against Nature. Um, I, pretty much everything I said about Everything Must Go, I say about this. I think this one might be slightly a little more better. Um, I think the songs I like on here, I like better than I like the songs on the previous album. And again, there's three of them that I think are kind of good. I think the title track is probably the highlight, Two Against Nature, the title track of this, the highlight of the last two albums. Um, it eventually just kind of establishes this low key, like little feet vibe, like Steely Dan in whenever this is, when did this come out? Way night 2000, right? Steely Dan, but they're running a little feet filter. So there's a little kind of what seems like a little feet, almost Southern little, little bit of funkiness that seeps into the title track. Um, and then I think that's by far the best of the last two albums. Then I like Cousin Dupree. I don't know. There's just something about the groove that works for me. And I like the album Closing West of Hollywood. Again, really nice use of horns. Has a very, there's momentum to the track. Um, it feels like West of Hollywood. You're dry, if, you're, if you're West of Hollywood, you're probably driving toward the Pacific Ocean. And there is something about the music of this song about driving toward the Pacific Ocean and like knowing that like infinity like seems to stretch before you and there's just this like momentum and then there's a sax saxophone solo at the end that kind of carries us out for a couple minutes. It's a it's a much looser, more relaxed, really good vibe on the closing track West of Hollywood. Um, other than that, I don't think the blandness is as bland as on Everything Must Go. But again, like 10 seconds into the first track, I'm like, I don't want to be here. I, I want to be literally on any other Steely Dan album. This isn't, and it is just the way it sounds. Like I recognize their song craft. I recognize their sort of smarmy, sarcastic lyrics at time, that sardonic edge that that uh, Fagan has. But um, yeah, I just, it, I, I just, it kind of bores me. Kind of just, uh, I don't like it. But yeah, that's my number eight, Two Against Nature. Yeah, they're fighting. They're, but it's not even Two Against Nature. Two Against Nature would be if this was a hardcore punk album because they're older, you know, they're dads or maybe not actual dads, but of that age where people say dad rock is a thing. Um, two Against Nature would have been something other than this. This feels like two old men settling into their old age, but still having that personality and character they had earlier on. All right, on to number seven. Number seven is their debut album, Can't Buy a Thrill. This came out back in 1972. Um, yeah, I don't think this is a bad album at all. This is a, this is a good album um, with a couple great moments. Um, and I think really out of there's 10 tracks on here, I think only two of them kind of like 
I just kind of don't like. The other ones are at the worst, like Steely Dan just being super competent, you know, really good sort of pop musicians with sort of this weird little New York edge to them. Um, you know, just in the intellectualness of it all or the the sort of, I don't know, I don't, I guess, I mean, there's a song on here that's kind of an attack on John Lennon. So sort of the sort of like, uh, attitude that they bring to the music. So, um, yeah, opens up with Do It Again, which is just a straight up classic. Just everything about that, the vibe, the groove, the solos, just everything about Do It Again works. Um, Dirty Work, one of the two songs sung by David Palmer. Um, it was kind of a minor hit. You might've heard it on the radio if you were if you only know Steely Dan from radio stuff. Um, he also sings Brooklyn Owns the Charm, Owes the Charmer Under Me, which I think is one of the best songs on this album. His performance makes that song. This sounds just like a real early 70s, like pop rock song, but it works. It's got really good, I don't know, the energy of Brooklyn is really good, but that appears on the second side. Um, uh, the last three songs on the first side are pretty good. Kings, Midnight Cruiser, and the pretty fantastic Only a Fool Would Say That, which is apparently their reaction to John Lennon's Imagine. Like, Only a Fool Would Say the, You know, here you are with your white Stetson hat, like the hero coming in to save the day with these words of blah. And it's uh, sort of a commentary on that. I think Palmer sings one of the verses on here too, or co-wrote it or something. Palmer sings a part of another song on here. Um, it might, I don't think it's that one, but anyways, that's a really good little song. When you know what it's about and it, that sort of meanness about it, where I don't know if it's meanness as much like how dare you preach peace, I think is a weird message, but you know, I see where they're coming from. I like that song. Side two opens up with real side two fizz don't exist anymore. Opens up with reeling in the years, which is a straight up classic. You can't deny the classicness of reeling in the years. You might get bored of it. I'm bored of it. I've heard it way too many times in my life, but man, that's a good song. Fire in the hole uh, is the second is after reeling. Then you get Brooklyn. Then you get change of the guard. The only two songs I really don't like are fire in the hole and change of the guard. Um, and then turn that heartbeat over again is the album closer, which I think is okay. Um, first side better than the second side, but the second side does have really in the years and Brooklyn owes the charm under me, which are pretty fantastic songs, but yeah, a solid album. Nothing bad. This is something I, I, I put on and I will listen to the entire thing and enjoy good album. They're number one. Can't buy a thrill. Number six is Gaucho. This came out in 1980, right? Um, 1980. Um, my mom owned this uh, with CD, one of the first CDs we bought. We listened to it all the time. I really, really enjoy this album. I wanted to rank it higher than number six. Um, and I almost had it at number five, but there were two songs at number five, which forced me to put that at number five. Um, but I really like this album. It is kind of somewhere between Asia's over-polished sort of higher level writing, but you know, you they can get away with that sort of super polished, super like, you know, so, what is the word I'm looking for? You know, minutely controlled where every little detail is, has to be perfect. That sort of, uh, God, I'm missing the word. My mind got drew a blank. Um, uh, micromanaged, I guess is maybe what I'm saying. Asia. Uh, and the later sort of just too blandness of the last two albums. It's kind of somewhere between there, but the song rate writing is so good on at least three of these songs that it kind of elevates this to number six. The opening Babylon Sisters, just fantastic. That do, 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 do. And then that or that little bubbly organ comes in. Like you just, ah, one of the most irresistible grooves ever. And... I love the uh, lyrics because there is one of my best sort of, one of my favorite parts of any um, uh, Steely Dan song is that, here come those Santa Ana winds again, right? That Which just sounds like, oh, it sounds like a good thing, right? But if you ever lived in Southern California and you knew those Santa Ana winds were, say, going to be there in the morning, you knew that there was, well, if you live down on the coast where I live, you knew there was going to be a hot uncomfortable wind blowing in your face all day. Here come those Santa Ana winds again. In my mind, at least when I was living in LA, back in like the 70s and 80s, that is not a good thing. That is a bad thing. I can't imagine it has gotten better with all the pollution there over the years. So I love the fact that the line feels like, here come those Santa Ana. I mean, it sounds like a good thing. It's not a good thing. Hey, 19. Awesome. What is that? May, December relationship, June, December. What, what do they call it? Uh, young little, 
19 year old doesn't even know who Aretha Franklin is, right? What are you doing? Get away from her. You guys have nothing to talk about. Um, great, just a great description of that sort of like dynamic with great, just that boom, that opening guitar note just held and then you drop into it. So many fantastic things on this. Um, and then the uh, fine, the uh, Cuervo Gold and the Fine Colombian, oh my gosh. Oh, what a near perfect song. Uh, Glamour Profession kind of goes on a little too long, but the fact that it goes on a little too long is what ultimately makes me like it because it just starts to have this sort of like rhythm, this groove that by the time it goes on too long, you're like, okay, I just, I'm actually into this and I just want it to go on longer and I kind of wish it was a couple minutes longer. Um, um, but yeah, it's interesting little track. I'm definitely not as good as the first two, but it's uh, enjoyable. And then side two or the fourth song, Gaucho. But, uh, he's your Gaucho amigo. I don't know, like what's going on here, what kind of relationship it is. Um, again, we got some sort of uh, gender bending, some sexuality questioning. We just got an awesome little character driven tale um, that has just got some beautiful saxophone in it. It's just such a neat little story. Don't know what's happening in it. Um, just a fun little track. And then the last three songs, Time Out of Mind, okay, My Rival, Third World Man, not bad, but they're nothing that I, I, I don't think are true standouts, but they're not horrible songs. They're passable. But I really like this album. <clears throat> I recognize it's got some weaknesses, but uh, it's the first one I really fell in love with as a kid. And I do think Babylon Sisters and Hey 19 are like upper echelon material that kind of... Because it's the first two tracks, they are the first two tracks, kind of lifts everything else up. But yeah, that's my number five. Uh, my number five, my number six, Gaucho. Number five is Countdown to Ecstasy. Their second album um, came out in 1973. 1973. Um, I wanted to rank Gaucho above this, but this album contains Showbiz Kids and my old school, which I think are two of their best tracks. Um, everything about Showbiz Kids, that guitar playing, that riff, that solo, those lyrics, everything about that song works. And same with my old school, that sort of piano driven rock, those great guitar breaks, um, the way at the end of every course, um, they have like a little horn, like, dun, dun, right? Like it's this little outro. And I think it's the first time uh, after the first course, and I may have this backwards, but I don't think so. After the first course, that little horn outro goes once, and then the guitar comes in. After the second course, it goes two times, and then the horns come in. And after the final first, it goes four times, where it almost feels like you're not getting a guitar solo, and then the guitar comes in. There's like essentially two guitar solos in the middle part with that awesome little horn break. Um, again, weird little lyrics about some what feels like some kind of deviancy going on at his old school. Don't know really what it's about, but just two of the best songs Steely Dan has made. And I could not put this at six. Um, I don't think the rest of this album, one song on this album rises to the occasion, but those two songs are just uh, just epic, epic things. Um, the rest of the album, and those are songs, uh, the opening two songs on side two, now tracks five and six, opens up with Bodhisattva, a really good high energy rocker. Um, I love that song. Um, it is one of the ones that they played a lot on LA radio back in the day. So it is one of those that I probably listen to this album less than I would because it is the opener. And I'm just, even though I always enjoy it when I listen to it, it's not something I'm like, oh, let's listen to Bodhisattva again. But I do like that song. Uh, Razor Boy, I think really the only weak track on the album. I really like Boston Rag. There's a really neat sort of near now, near now. This really neat guitar intro that like just mm, every time it just gets me. So by the by the time they get to that bring home or on the Boston Rag, you gotta bring it on. Love that part. Um, and then your gold teeth, which I really like. A longer, the longest one on the album, a little proggier, proggier, feels a little jammier, a little more relaxed. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the gold teeth, both of them. Um, then we get Showbiz Kids, My Old School, Pearl of the Quarter, which is an awesome little, kind of their take on Brandy, you're a fine girl. Only this fine girl works down in New Orleans. So she's a pearl of the quarter. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a Steely Dan take on that old woman back at port type thing. Uh, interesting little track. 
Um, that's the way I always think of it. And King of the World, which has one of my uh, favorite all-time lyrics for reasons I've never understood. But I'm reading last year's papers, and though I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. I like uh, that line. I'm reading last year's papers, although I don't know why. Oh, I tried to look up uh, the lyrics for that. They came up with a Natalie Grant song. I don't know who that is. But yeah, I really like that song. Um, yeah, anyways. But yeah, that would be it. Uh, my number five. Uh, it's a good album, a solid album. Um, really, there's only one track. I think Razor Boy is not that good, but the rest of it is fantastic. And Showbiz Kids and My Old School, two of the best songs Steely Dan has ever done. Two of the best songs ever, possibly, right? All right, on to number four. Number four is 1977's Asia, their sixth album, right? Their sixth album. Um, I'll just get this out of the way now. I am not that big of a fan of the song Asia itself. Takes up eight minutes on side one out of what, 12 minutes, 13 minutes. So it's like a third of, of more than a third of the side. I just, it doesn't do it for me. Uh, the, the whole, there's, it's, it's eight minutes long because there's this sort of prolonged instrumental, <coughs> almost proggy section that just, I don't know. I've never little even like drum solo action, though it's not an actual solo, but some great drum work. Um, but I just, oh yeah, no, I thought it was Ralph Humphrey. Paul Humphrey plays drums. I just, it just doesn't connect with me. And it's such a big chunk of the album. And it's the second song on the album that I'm like, uh, yeah. So I'm getting that out of the way. I've never been a fan of Asia. I've tried many times. I, I can see why people would like it. But to me, the, that overproduced middle section with the little symphonic parts and the did, 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 did that part, that to me kind of sounds like Yacht Rock trying to be prog. And I don't think they pull it off. You know what they do pull off? The cool funk of Black Cow. Oh my goodness. Perfection. Yes, you pulled it off. What else did they pull off? I don't know why Deacon Blues is as epic as sort of like, I don't know. Deacon Blues is one of the most special songs ever. I don't know why. As soon as that, that song starts, uh, that tail, the chorus, they call Alabama the Crimson Tide, they call me Deacon Blues. Just everything about that song just... It's not trying too hard to be epic. Like really musically, it's just a pretty standard format, right? Uh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, right? Solo, chorus, maybe, maybe another verse, chorus. Like just, but the lyrics, there's something about the lyrics, something about that chorus, something about the overall vibe that to me, that song is like untouchable. Peg, is there a more perfect pop song than Peg? The horns, the lyrics, everything, Peg perfection um go listen to peg right now if you haven't heard it that thing is like a little pop nugget little kind of funky but not really very poppy little just uh oh, steely dan at their purest best home at last has a nice upbeat kind of royal scam type vibe at least in the very beginning that did that kind of groove um i got the news maybe the weakest out song on here other than Asia. And then the awesome Josie, which kind of closes out with a little bit of that, that funk that the Fez kind of has. Just kind of a little bit like, yeah, we're feeling good. We're feeling, maybe everybody wants to dance a little bit before we send you home. Um, ends, the, ends the album on a perfect note. So four, I ranked it as four. You know, I, I know there's a lot of people that think this is their like masterpiece, but and I think a lot of people point to the song Asia as proof of that. I don't like that song, so I can't count this song as their masterpiece. I think they have three others. This one has never been able to craft a top three for me. Um, but yeah, I, I get why people like it, but I'm not one of those people. So anyways, yeah, my number four, Asia. My number three is 1974's Pretzel Logic. Um, and this album used to bother me. Um, I've always liked all the songs on the album, but I always thought this had a, a sequencing problem. I never really, really liked the sequencing on this album. I thought 
Had the songs been put in a different order, it would be a better album. I always thought Ricky Don't Lose That Number was this weird sort of like, just a little too low key. I don't like songs that, I don't like albums that open up with like quieter sort of like, not build ups, but just like noises. And then you drop into the song. And though this drop is a pretty like, doom, 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 pretty soft drop, it still has like 10 seconds of weird noise that you don't need, like little distant xylophones or marimbas. Um, and then Night by Night is the second song, just didn't in any way match the energy of Ricky. Then you go back to Any Major Dude, which, and all these are fantastic songs, mind you, but then Any Major Dude, we drop in, it's like acoustic, like really vibe. And then we get Berry Town, which is kind of like an energy of Night by Night. And so we're having this weird dichotomy of going back and forth or this weird just yin yang that isn't seeming to connect and then the side a fifth song closes out with east st louis toodaloo which is like a cover of the duke ellington song and it has this do do you know really jazzy traditional type number and it used to really bother me the sequencing on this so then you go to the second side and you just have these great little weird funky f fun pop songs Parker's band about Charlie Parker, Through with Buzz, which seems to be about drug deals gone wrong or something like that, or d habits being kicked. Pretzel Logic, absolutely epic monster song with a great organ buildup, and I think one of another one of their fantastic songs. With a Gun, another weird little number. Charlie Freak, another weird little pop number. Really character driven, these really seedy type people. And then Monkey in Your Soul, which is straight up awesome little funk. Uh, a friend of mine is a college radio DJ. I want to say he used to, it was a college radio DJ. He does play by play for baseball now, but he was working at KSY, not KSYM, that's here. Uh, Calax, Calax in uh, Berkeley. And I was listening to him one night and he dropped, I think he played, he played the, the Berkeley marching band. I think it what it was into monkey in your soul. And then back into the Berkeley marching band it was some weird little something like that. It was brilliant. Um, but, then the more I listened to this album and the more I, I got used to the sequencing and the more I just accepted the fact that this is what it is, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's like weird pretzel logic here. I don't understand why it's sequenced this way. But over the years, as I listened to this collection of what is a pretty weird eclectic little mix of songs over the years, it just all made perfect sense. And it just felt even more beautiful than ever. And Ricky Don't Lose That Number is probably the safest song on here. It starts off as the most generic soft rock, and by the end of it, it's an absolutely fantastic pop song. Monkey in Your Soul, at the end of this journey, is by far the weirdest song on here. And at the same time, both of them just feel like Steely Dan. So, I don't know who sequenced it. I don't know why they put it in this order. I thought for years that it could be in a better order. But I'm understanding now there's some weird pretzel logic going on and it's mad genius. And this is, I think, their most fun album. It's just a fun album. And it, at times, at times, a little meaningful, hits home a little bit, maybe, but just powerful awesomeness. Pretzel logic, my number three. My number two is Katie Lied, their fourth album, right? Uh, released in 1975. Um, yeah, this is a fantastic album. Like, I think this sequencing is perfect. The The songs are perfect. Um, this one and what is number one have gone back and forth my entire life as to which one I like more. But when I was re-listening to them in this recent time, um, there is a song on the next album that when that song dropped, I was about halfway through it. I was like, oh yeah, th this is the album. Um, but... This is still, I think this is a great album. This is Steely Dan. This is what they do best. This run of three albums from Pretzel Logic, Katie Lied to the next one. It's just, it's just perfection. It's like really smart pop, really sort of lyrics that are looking at sort of like the underbelly of life or people on the fringes or, you know, that kind of like those kind of characters, sort of a not as seedy and like late night as like a Tom Waits sort of character character list but people that you just they're doing things that maybe you shouldn't be doing where tom waits peoples or peoples are more down on their luck these people have created their bad luck because maybe they're not good people that's always the vibe i kind of get with these steely damn things but anyways also i thought back in the day that there was a concept album buried in this album um 
that essentially Black Friday, the opening track, you know, was the, sort of the collapse of sort of a financial system. A lot of people lost a lot of money. We had some poor people. Great rocker, great guitar work, fantastic opener. Um, and then Bad Sneakers literally were then following one main character who's down on his luck. He's out on the street. Um, they, they're literally digging a ditch for him out in the valley because he's about to die because he just has nothing. Um, but uh, th those opening two tracks, Black Friday and, and Bad Sneakers, just awesome rocker into one of this, what sounds like just this really simple AM radio pop song, but the lyrics are so good and that break in the middle is so good and just everything about it. Uh, Bad Sneakers, phenomenal song. Um, Rose Darling is next. I always thought then this guy then found a woman who would help take care of him. Daddy don't live in that New York City no more. Uh, Daddy didn't seem like a good person. Whoever he is in the song, he just doesn't feel. Like I feel like maybe Daddy's a pimp and then Rose Darling used to be his girl and that's why this guy from Black Friday Bad Sneakers can, can maybe live with her because her daddy don't live in that New York City no more. He's going elsewhere. Um, but that's a nice, really funky song. Then you get Dr. Wu, which is just like awesome. Absolutely fantastic. I think Dr. Wu is either a dealer or the drug itself. Um, but Dr. Wu, it's just this really, it, it's, it just feels it like a tale of people who are desperate for something and looking for something and they're down on their luck and, you know, they find that one thing and Dr. Wu provides that relief. But what is it that he's providing? Great saxophone solo that almost seems like it doesn't work in the song because it's so uplifting. But by the end of it, it also feels like maybe it's the false high that was promised because the end of it, you're just like, oh, right. Uh, you're just like struggling to make it. Um, everyone's gone in the movies. I think this is about making uh, some blue movies. Um, like, hey, come back to my place, man. We'll make you some movies. Everybody's gone to the movies now, you know, because people are down on their luck. They're trying to make ends meet. So they're, they're making their own amateur videos. Uh, Your Gold Teeth 2, fantastic follow-up to the original Your Gold Teeth. Excellent little song. Um, look in, a little more proggy action. Chain Lightning, things have gone bad, man. Fascist leaders have taken over. Don't question what they're saying. Just join in the crowd because it's Chain Lightning and it feels so good. And this is one of the darker songs in this album, like both lyrically and the vibe. Any World That I'm Welcome To, um, yeah, hey, I found a home. It's kind of an upbeat, positive song. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, any world that I'm welcome to is better than the one I come from. Right, so this guy's finally found a home towards the end. And then throw back the little ones and pan fry the big ones. You're now exacting your revenge, man. Let's go after those big people. So anyways, I always felt there was a conceptual theme through these songs. I think I don't think there's a bad song on this album. It's fun. It's like the playing is fantastic. Like the whole thing uh, or the accusations at them is that they've sort of micromanaged the songs and that like they squeeze, like, not that they squeeze the life out of them, but they're just this studio polish that just lacks something. I don't think that's anywhere evident on Pretzel Logic, this one or the next one. Those albums sound alive and vibrant and full of energy and there's just so much going on. Fantastic, fantastic album. All right, my number two. Let's get on to number one. It is... And number one is 1975's The Royal Scam. Every song on this album feels like a movie. That's the way I've always thought about that just feels like there's like there's something going on like it's like not necessarily the soundtrack to a film but it's the the inspiration for a film and they literally just took the song and made it into a movie it just feels like there's a very visual element to what's going on the, the storytelling is strong and that, that whole thing that whole concept is sort of bolstered by a single lyric on here in a song called Haitian Divorce where I think the line is uh you know there's sort of I think it's verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and we're in sort of this post-chorus bridge heading off into a solo, and there's a line about, then we dolly back, then we fade to black. Like, oh, we are in a movie, you know? Definitely for that song, but the whole album kind of feels that way. Opens up with Kid Charlemagne, guitar playing, organ playing, uh, drumming, oh my gosh, the drumming, lyrics about sort of a um, um, Owsley Bear 
type figure, probably with a little chemistry setup in San Francisco, you know, making some goodies and selling them to the locals. God, I got to hit the road because people are looking for them. Caves of, Al Caves of Altamira, you know, childhood wonders, to, uh, childhood explorers discovering some wonderful things in some caves. Um, don't take me alive. Yeah. Hold up fugitive. You're not going to take me alive. Awesome guitar work. Just that open nan arpeggio that just kind of rings out and the guitar comes in with that solo. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, sign in stranger, kind of weird jazz, funky with some like just weird fills and both guitar and uh, piano. One of their more funkier sort of like, I think the, the sign, you're signing into some weird kind of like the, the image of the place is kind of like in John Wick, the movies, the hotel, what is the hotel that they go to, you know, when they have to check in someplace. And it feels like that kind of place is where you're checking into on this song. And then the song that ultimately made me put this album at number one, The Fez. And don't you do it without your Fez on. And I think The Fez is, as they say, some places is the sort of, what do they say in uh, that movie? Uh, it's the... Uh, it's the little uh, Monty Python, but it's something you put on your John Thomas. It's the little the little sheath, the hoodie sh hooded sheath you put on your John Thomas or something like that. I think that's what the Fez is a reference to. Or I read that somewhere and believed it ever since. But I was listening to the Fez. I'm just in the middle of it. I'm just like, oh, just like grooving. And it's just got that, that funk and that groove. And I was like, this is unbeatable. How do you beat a song like the Fez? Might not be my favorite song. But man, to drop a The Fez in the middle of an album, fantastic. After that, it's Green Earrings, which has one of the best ever, I think it's five seconds of music. It's right before they go into the guitar solo. There's this little drum fill that's just like, I think it's like a, it's like a couple hits on like snares or toms or something. And then this like double hi-hat, like, and then the guitar comes in with the, and like with, oh, Go listen to Green Earrings and pay particular attention right before they hit the guitar solo. And if you have to, rewind it and listen to it again because that drum work and the way that guitar comes in, oh, magical. Haitian Divorce, nice little reggae wah wah tinge story about a couple who are going through some problems and apparently they get divorced. Haitian style, really fun song. Um, Everything You Did makes a reference to the Eagles. Um, turn Up the Eagles. Uh, turn up the eagles. Turn up, turn up the eagles. The neighbors are fighting. No, that's not the line. Um, but there's an eagles reference, and uh, because of this, I want to say the eagles then wrote those shoes and made a no. They made a Steely Dan reference in uh, Hotel California, right? And then they said cut them with their steely knives. Turn up the eagles. The neighbors are listening because uh, these people are fighting about everything you did. Um, so then they paid them back with the, stabbed them with their steely knives. Oh, okay. Um, apparently that's the story. And then the awesome, the Royal Scam Closer, which just has this really nice, doo -doo, this nice kind of repetitive groove about people who are pulling off some sort of Royal Scam. Just an epic album. Every song has a completely different vibe and energy. And there's a probably a single performance in each song or a single moment you're like, ugh, it doesn't get better than that. My number one, whatever album we're talking about, The Royal Scam, The Royal Scam. And that's it. Those are my rankings for Steely Dan's albums. Um, yeah, number one and two have always been one or two. Um, and those bottom two have been on the bottom two since I heard them. So anyways, yeah, let me know what yours are. Let me know what you think. Let me know, you know, thoughts, comments, whatever. Um, but subscribe, like, share, and go listen to music, people. More importantly, go listen to music, all the music. Go listen to that drum break in Green Earrings. I'm one of the most fantastic musics, moments in rock. All right, y'all. Thanks for watching. Peace. Talk to you later.